Well, we, we, yeah, we already came to order. We're, re we're reassembling. Um, and we are working on um, the budget. We've been working on the budget, and I believe we are ready for a motion to appro pro approve the select board's budget for presentation to the town at town meeting. Okay, so I would make a motion that we approve the general fund and highway budget for FY24 in a total amount of $1,629,831. We're not doing cents. General government is 738397 and highway is 891433. Um, and this does not include social services appropriations or other warned articles. So General government for highway and Rick has seconded. Any other discussion? Um, one comment, Denise, the overall percentage increase on, on what we just mentioned is um, something just short of 6%. Hey, you is, made it. Oh, look who's here. Um, yeah, it's just short of 6%. Just and we, short, we, short. we cut a bunch of... <laughs> We're about to vote on the budget. We're about to vote on the budget. Yes. It's, just, it's, just, it's right around 6%. And we, we spent... 6% increase. We spent a lot of time going through line by line by line making cuts okay. and where we could that wouldn't affect the services to the town. Um, so anyway, so there's a motion on the table. It's been seconded. Um, yeah, we met starting in November. Yeah, probably like November. we have to add it up. Probably 15 or more hours as a board. Oh, at least. At least, um, at least working on the budget. So anyway. Um, so do you want to take the vote? All in favor, please say aye. 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 This is the budget. Yes. This is the right. budget. Aye. Correct. Yes. Hey, okay. Mark is here. We didn't Okay, great. You. Great. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Uh, okay, so we are uh, now, yeah, now moving into uh, our Curtis Pond Dam discussion and we have our attorney um the town's attorney is with us bob fletcher um and maybe bob you just want to join us briefly the folks here may have also the gentleman yeah i think and I is think, fred here right i think bob should yeah i think bob oh, should right. join us at the table and then we can ask fred to um why don't why don't each of you okay. wait? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, you wanna, uh, yeah. Mark, yeah, Mark, why don't you announce what you're doing right now? Yeah, I'm accusing myself because I think it's appropriate for appearance purposes since I am I have a cabin on the lot. Okay, so Mark is recusing and Bob and Fred, why don't I would invite you to speak stand, just stand and introduce yourself sure. so everybody else knows who you are. Yeah, hi, I'm Bob Fletcher, uh, Stitzel Page of Fletcher in Burlington. Um, I practice for 40 something years. And you represent the, you're, the firm represents the town. <laughs> yes. um, right. when they're an outside legal counsel, and Bob specifically has been supporting us in questions related to Curtis Pond Dam. And Fred? Yeah, hi, uh, good evening. Fred Satink uh, with uh, Vermont League Cities and Towns, Passive. And uh, so I'm the deputy director of underwriting and loss control. And really, you know, I, I've had communications with, you know, a number of folks, both within the town and outside the town over the last couple of years. But really, I'm here uh, at the town's re request and really serving on their behalf as their kind of insurance advisor. So, uh, so Bob, I'm going to ask you to join us. But I think maybe what I'll t do is... Either, yeah, you can join yeah, us here at the table, here, Bob. Bob. Um, Bob. Bob isn't necessarily going to take the lead because, you know, what Bob says to us is sometimes often usually attorney-client privilege, so he's going to be very careful about what he says, and that's a caution for all of us as well. Um, would either John or Denise like to give just a kind of a background of where we are and what what decisions we have in front of us that we we are gonna have to make some some kind of decision. Provide an overview but yeah. I think most yeah. of the CPA people know so already the dam is <clears throat> current dam is in rough condition, right? 
Um, it's on property that years ago we determined was owned by the Fothergills, or Candace anyway. Um, Candace and Jeff Fothergill. Um, and an arrangement has been worked out with them where they would allow for the reconstruction or the construction of a new dam behind the existing laid up stone dam. Um, laid up stone dam would remain a kind of a facade or maybe even be integrated into the concrete mass as to be determined. But um, they will allow that construction while still under their ownership, which they won't admit to, but they will not stop the construction from happening. The state was are willing to make an accommodation in terms of the application process to allow that. It's an unusual circumstance. And then the idea, the process that we anticipate um, is that if and when this goes forward and there's funding found through both private donation and bonding, that once the dam is completed and an, an ad, set of as-built engineering drawings are stamped by the engineer and certified, uh, that the dam was built to standards, and uh, my understanding is a 50-year lifespan is the most they'll certify a dam of this nature uh, as having. Um, once that's done, then the town would seek insurance. Um, insurance would be approved by passive, and the town would take ownership. That is, has been the thinking all along, uh, but there are some wrinkles uh, in what seems to be, at first glance, an easy path. There is, you know, Bob's gonna talk about this, uh, how, how do we get from the beginning to the end of the process I described uh, and um, successfully uh, win bonding if, if the voters of the town, oh, let me back up, we would have to put a bond vote for the amount of more or less $400,000 out uh, to the uh, voters of the town of Callis. It would be done by an Australian ballot. It's not a show of hands at town meeting. Um, these kinds of encumbrances are done by Australian ballot. Um, and if successful, um, the voters approve the bond initiative, um, then the bond bank um, would have to issue a bond. So Bob's gonna talk a little bit about the criteria they, they review bond requests against and and some of the finer points that I'm not that experienced in. Um, and um, where else? So then there's, so there's the bond piece and then there's the insurance piece that uh, we only recently began to perform our due diligence on. Um, Mark can fill you in on his exploratory, he said it, I think Mark said he did two years ago. But um, Fred will explain what PASSIF, which is the arm of Vermont League of Cities and Towns that provides insurance to municipalities and <coughs> would be insuring this dam, at least in part. Um, and you know, we can have a discussion about insurance over and above that, again, if the bond's approved, et cetera. So there, there are um, a couple ways uh, a bond uh, initiative can be put out. It can be, um, folks can ask the select board and the select board can vote to allow a bond vote to happen. Um, or there can be a petition of the select board to make that happen. Petition, petition to the select to board. The select petition board. of, to, to, to the select right, board. Yeah. Um, I think that meant the same thing, but okay. To yeah. the select board <laughs> by their requisite number of signatures of uh, registered voters, which is 5% of the registered voters. I, I don't know what that number comes to. You I think to, it's like... It's like 60, 70 or something. 60. You want to get extras if you do it. And we need to have... It's 10%. 10%. 10 oh, okay. okay. I thought I'm it was wrong. 10%. I've been wrong before. Yeah, 10%. 10%. Okay. So there we go. Um, that's where we have Bob and Mark. Um, and so that's, that's an alternative of the select board just doing it on their own initiative. And we're going to have that conversation tonight as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm done. Um, so we're just. I want to. I want to just um, add an element that I've been kind of thinking about. John broke it down into two pieces: the bond and the insurance. The bond is 
part of, you know, phase one, if you will, how does the work get paid for? Mm -hmm. The insurance is how does, how is it, how is liability insured moving forward? It's not even insurable now. Um, if it, if it were prepared, repaired, um, then it would be insurable, but that opens up a whole other bunch of questions. Um, when we first started the conversation, at least in my, in this conversation has bubbled over, um, ebbed and flowed and bubbled using all the water metaphors for 10 or more years, uh, right? 20. 20. Right. So in my time on the board, it's been actively in front of us for about a year, maybe a year and a half, actively-ish. Mm -hmm. um, there were some other di I ideas on the table originally in the early days for how it could get paid for and one was through an assessment district mm -hmm. and and what I understood recently is that the folks around the pond had worked to raise some money privately in lieu of that because of its complications but I actually would like Bob to just remind us of what you know what an assessment because that's a piece that's a piece of paying for it that we're not actively talking about so maybe just to kind of you know weave it in weave that it bring that back up and remind ourselves what the what that is and because it's a piece of phase one it, it could be so Bob I'm going to start by just asking you to remind us what an assessment district would mean and what the paths to that are okay um so a special assessment district uh, is a geographic um, denomination or delineation of a portion of a town or any municipality uh, for purposes of uh, distributing or recovering costs uh, within uh, that SAD, within that special assessment mm -hmm. district for a public improvement that benefits that special assessment district. So you see it used, um, uh, special assessment districts used for sewer, sewer line extensions, as an example, uh, where there's a main that stops at this corner and there's a new development that, that's coming in with 400 houses. And they want, obviously, to be on the public sewer system, but the main stops here. You can uh, create a special assessment district for purposes of covering the expense of that infrastructure improvement, that extension of the sewer main and, and collection system to serve those 400 houses. And you would you assess against those 400 houses only the cost, that capital improvement cost, so that you're not, um, you're not asking all of the folks on this side of the end of the main <clears throat> who have already paid their share of getting the system in place, they're already being served. You ask the new 400 people to pay for them. Um, so that's the concept of a special assessment district. And it needn't be simply sewer lines. It can be um, any, any sort of public infrastructure uh, or, or e even economic development. You will see sometimes uh, downtown cities where a special assessment district is created to recover the cost of infrastructure improvements. I mean, that's essentially it's essentially a TIF uh, by any other name, if you will, a, a tax increment financing district, right? It gets a little complicated when you think about TIFs, but, but the, the concept is essentially the same. You're asking a, a defined geographic area to pay costs associated with an improvement that benefits that area principally. There are two ways to get a special assessment district. Um, you can go to all of the folks in that special assessment district area, that geographic area, and get unanimous consent to its establishment. Or you can put out to the voters uh, in, the, in the municipality as a whole the question, you know, shall a special assessment district be created for the purposes of recovering these expenses? And its delineations, its geographic limits are, you know, Main Street, West Street, North Street, you know, Maple Street, whatever it is, right? So you define the area, you define the expense, you define the purpose, and the voters get to choose. And so you can have everybody in that district 
unanimously agree, or you can have the voters vote to create the special assessment district. And it's a, it's a straight up majority vote. So can the special assessment district have it so that some, this group pays a little more, this group pays a little less, this geographic area pays a little less. Can you do a tiered? Yeah, a tiered. Um, you, you can, I, I will tell you that doing that by, by vote would be um, really cumbersome, right? What would the question look like? It would be, you know, if they're in this area, they, they pay 100%. If they're in this area, they pay 85 or 50, you know. It, it gets to the point where uh, you'd have a hard time writing a question that was clear enough that when you got to the other end and somebody said the votes are 6A and 4A, what did the A's really mean and what did the A's really mean? Right. So if you're going to do some kind of, uh, if you want to create some kind of concentric circle special assessment district, I would recommend that that be done by by agreement of the special assessment district, because then right. you'd be able to you'd be able to draw the lines, you'd be able to get the signatures, and you'd know there's unanimous consent. I'm so afraid. if there was one property owner within that described district that refused to agree to it, where does that leave you? It leaves you without a special assessment district okay. until the voters vote on it. But the vote, but if the voters vote on it, so um, in so all of Callis votes in a in a some kind of a simplified you know yes no here's an assessment district yes or no that's a simple majority of the town mm -hmm. and of the town not of the district itself right okay right. And, the yes. reason, and the reason I'm asking about this because this was one of the things that was discussed earlier on was a tiered special assessment district and we recognize that that would be difficult and complicated to make happen or even figure out how it would work. So, I think a tier a tier would be hard. A, yeah. A tier would be hard unless you did it with a map in front of you and you had all the people, you know, you knew that you weren't going to subdivide or merge any of them. Well mergers mergers fine, but subdividing the lots is a would be a complicating factor. Right? Oh I see. But if you had if you had a defined area and you had defined development within that area and you could say everybody shaded in yellow is this, everybody shaded in blue is that, everybody shaded in pink is this, yeah. right? You could do it, but, but I would suggest to you uh, if you do it, if you were going to do it that way, you would want to do it by, by getting the signatures of the affected property owners, okay. not trying to take it to a vote. Because so, I think yeah. the voters would be confused by it. They would because somebody they, not in that district wouldn't wouldn't apply to them, right? But they could still get to vote on it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. so you could. Well, I'm just saying, saying it would be complicated. You, you could you could simplify it. You could. I uh, know we don't want to cover this too much longer, but right. you could say those who whose properties directly adjoin a lake pay, you know, a hundred percent of the rate, one x and. You could say those with properties within this district, but don't ed directly adjoin the lake, do not have the actual lakefront property pay 50% of X. And that can be that would be simple. My, my question is for clarification, actually, is um, so lacking unanimity, say you, you, you attempted, the town attempted to get unanimous approval of those in the assessment district and there were one or two that said no so that failed the town could have a vote of all the voters and they and what if everyone in the assessment district said we don't want it if you could somehow figure that out and yet the rest of the town could impose that on them yes the answer is yes. Even yeah. though we don't own the land currently, we can impose it ahead of, no, in anticipation of. No, I, I would this is, do it simultaneously with, with yeah. the project. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's how you're going to pay for it, right? Yeah. 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 I think yeah. we gave up on yeah, this I, idea, but I'm, I'm glad that we brought it up again. Well, it's difficult. I think we gave up on it on the idea that every person had to agree. Right. But the re awareness that the voters can vote on it. Is is yeah? I didn't know that before. Well, that's that's yeah, I didn't very important information because 
that's one of the things we struggle with is who bears the cost. Yeah. And so being aware that being aware that it's a you know, it's yes and. Yes, we're doing this, the town is doing it, and there's a possibility of a special assessment district that everybody in town gets to vote on to help pay for it is something we need to keep in mind in our in it just in our toolbox. But um, let's go now to the another tool in the toolbox is bonding mm -hmm. to pay for a dam and the complication there is that the town doesn't own it, it's owned privately. Mm -hmm. So threading the needle of how a ta town bonds for something it doesn't own is what is what Bob's right. gonna tell us about. Well it, it, yeah, I mean you understand that The issuance of uh, a bond or public debt um, requires that there be a public purpose or use. Public, not private. Unless you have specific statutory authority. Right? So how does the city of Cleveland, for instance, build a football stadium? But have special statutory authority. Or they have a, have a governmental unit that, you know, that, that it comprises the stadium, for instance. Um, there are no stat specific statutory authority that I'm aware of in Vermont for dam repair. There's very little, if any, statutory authority in Vermont for dam repair. So you have to look at this from uh, the perspective that you want to make whatever, you, you want whatever you do to be legal and, and enforceable because you don't want to spend years litigating on the backside uh, for having uh, having issued a bond and then uh, not be able to either collect the taxes to pay for it or to preserve its tax exemption status if that's how you sold it, right? It depends on how you sell it. Um, so you want to comply from beginning to end with the requirements. And one of the principal requirements for a bond, a public debt in Vermont, is that it be a public use or a public benefit. What, how is that defined? What's that? How, what is the definition of a public benefit? Well, it, it is uh, undefined, Denise, uh, except by reference to case law. And I think uh, I've shared it in the past. Um, it has to, your, your principal and initial purpose has to be to um, um, subserve a, a public use or public benefit. The, the project itself has to be of significant enough public use or <coughs> to satisfy the law. The what, one, uh, one condition for that and one that the bond bank will require is that you own and will continue to own the facility being financed. That's a certification you need to make to the bond bank to the tax certificate, which is part of the closing package. Um, and if you cannot make that certification, if you can't if you can't comply with the tax certificate, you can't sign it and deliver it in good faith, then you have a problem selling the bond um, to the bond bank. And you know, in anticipation of the next question, um, if you're not able to sell it to the bond bank, you're likely unable to sell it to any reputable lender because they're not going to make you file a, or sign a tax certificate that looks exactly like the bond bank's tax certificate, but it will essentially contain the same provisions. What is a tax certificate? I don't know what that is. It is a multi-page document that says, uh, in order to induce the bond bank to buy um, your bond, your municipal bond, uh, you promise that you have done all these things, that you will continue to do these things, uh, not only uh, now, but in the future. Um, so it's a, it's a certification that the... So until the bond is paid off. Until the bond is paid off. And in your opinion, does this project meet, qualify for this tax certification? At the moment, it doesn't because you don't own the facility. Right, but if we if it's fixed, 
if, if, if you were, the, the only provision I found in the tax certificate, that was, the, the provision in the tax certificate that I found to be most problematic is that ownership one. The ownership one, okay. But, you know, because there's no other use that's, that it's going to be put to, it's not a private activity bond, and I know this is complicated, but a private activity bond would be a bond uh, that is... That this is different than the bond bank? Uh, well, the bond bank is an institution. It is a body to whom you sell your bond. Mm -hmm. A private activity bond is a type of bond, uh, and it is a bond that has uh, private use and private security. Um, so uh, if, you sell, if you sell bonds to finance the, uh, um, keep picking on Cleveland, I don't know why, but you know, to build a football stadium in Cleveland, if you're turning it over to the Cleveland Football Club, they're, they're the primary user of it. And it's not, a, there's no public, you know, there, there's incidental public benefit, like you get to go see the Cleveland Browns get beat every week. But the, the, there's no right to, for any citizen of Cleveland to go in and, and occupy a seat or to set up a camp on the 50-yard line or cook food at the, at, you know, in any of the, Retail places, um, you know, in the food distribution facilities. You can't go and sit in the, in the chair of the coach. You can't work out in the workout room, right? No, nobody in the public has that right because you've devoted that you, that that right to a private individual, private entity. Um, and if you make that private individual pay back, right, with revenues or, or some in some other fashion, if the if the use is tied to the, to the repayment then you've got a private security side. Now you've got a private activity bond. It's a completely different animal under the IRS tax code. It's not where you want to be. Okay. So okay. you don't want to be there. Um, there, are, there are plenty of people who get there, but you don't want to be there. Um, so you have, um, you have you know, the ownership and control problem. And, um, you've got, I think, incidentally, probably enough public, um, the accrual of sufficient public benefits to, to otherwise meet the law. To meet the bond bank's requirements. Well, you don't think of it as the bond bank's requirements. The bond bank's IRS. just implementing, the, the bond bank's just implementing oh, this is this statute. It's, it has a separate statute that it has to require, it has to comply with. This what you're trying to do is satisfy the tax code and satisfy decisional law, case law in Vermont as to what is a public purpose. And in this instance, you've got, you know, sort of the incidental benefits of recreation and aesthetics. You've got a, an investment, a town investment um, in, a, in a swimming area. You've got um, the, the surrounding attributes of, of folks with properties that are on the lake and, and, and the town owns two rivers. different properties. We own the island. We own the island, and right. And the swim area. We're getting to the island. Oh. John's just <laughs> working my way to the island. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, you know, know, so, you, so you've got those things. Um, and so you said we had sufficient public purpose. I'm asking because I'm, I'm trying to make a note. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, it's not like you're building a, a, a sewer line extension or, or a road mm -hmm. where you can say, you know, pretty clearly that's public benefit. Mm -hmm. right? This one's more accretive, right? You look at all the things that might be of public benefit. Um, you know, and clearly you can have playgrounds and, and uh, recreational areas. Uh, you can have open space. You can have aesthetic spaces. You know, if you can create a park, what, why couldn't you have a pond, right? In this case, you're, you're taking, you're buying you're buying the right to fix the dam to preserve the pond. Mm -hmm. It's not like the dam itself is a public use or benefit. It's not generating hydro. It's not being used for flood control in a way, right? I mean, y yes, it's it's keeping the pond where it's supposed to be. But if the if it were to be carefully um, breached. And water to, were to be released. It's not as if the dam exists to hold back a river. It's not like a Hoover Dam, right? To impound water. It's it, in a way it is, but it's not being used for 
for public power generation or some other purpose. But it, it's there, so the pond exists. Without it, the pond wouldn't exist. Right. Um, and no one from the public, uh, I would hope, and I, Fred hopes, uh, that you're not going to allow the public to go down and just sit on the dam, uh, you know, and dangle their feet in the water mm -hmm. and, and picnic on top of it because, you know, that's a, that's a potential risk, right? You don't want, from a liability perspective, you don't want that kind of public use. Right? So you have to find the incremental and, right. and a creative public benefits around it. Right, and there's a state fishing. Well, there's a fishing. And access, but that's not ours. Denise, no, but stop it's, trying to take that. Yeah. But that's not, you know, you have to look at it from the from the municipal perspective, not from the state's right. perspective. Not from no, I'm just saying the state wanted to buy the wanted to buy the Right. I'm just saying it's there. They could say, hey, there's yeah. a fishing here. But um, you, you, as the town, your responsibility is to see that there's enough there for you. Mm -hmm. For for you right. and your and your cats. <coughs> so <coughs> that's you know, that's one issue. Um, <coughs> The other issue is, has already, or another issue has already been um, referenced, and that's what about um, construction period liability, post construction period liability? Um, the but in between, it's, it's constructed, it's certified by an engineer, but we haven't yet signed it over to the town. Well, I'm worried about, uh, I think. Counsel, you to be worried about what uh, what if you take control or have access to it in, to the dam um, <clears throat> without with or without having title. But if you have title or you have control of the area and there's a problem with it, and the problem with the dam is a breach or a failure, um, you are going to be probably the first named defendant in a lawsuit. That, um, that gets filed uh, in Washington Superior Court or Federal District Court that says, uh, I was injured because the town was negligent in the way that it filled in the blank. Managed the dam, uh, protected people downstream, uh, hired a contractor, hired an engineer, didn't act quickly enough, acted too quickly. This is know. prior to our taking ownership yeah. in the interim? Yeah. Because we were because instrumental in it. Yeah. If it's your job site, if it's your if it's right. your work site, if you say to somebody, hey, I've got the owner's permission and, and I am a co-applicant for a co-permittee, you can now go on that property and start to dig holes, that's your liability whether you own it or not, because now you're controlling that site. And, and as I said, you're going to be the first name defendant. There are going to be a lot of your friends will be there with you. Uh, but misery in that case, may, you know, or company, company is just misery in that case because it's just, you know, a list of people. The engineer would get sued, the contractor would get sued, you know, whoever was running the backhoe would get sued, the excavator would get sued. Uh, you know, if if uh, uh, a 501c3 or something like the CPA, if that's what they are, the Curtis Pond mm -hmm. Association, were to sign the application and they instructed the contractor or the engineer who instructed the contractor, so, but yet, but we still approve the bond, and this was done in anticipation, you know, with <coughs> town bonding, would, it, yeah. would that shift the liability or would it still yeah, be? Yeah, it would shift the liability because in that case, it would be. Uh, the 501c3, the, the Curtis Pond Association, would be the primary mover. The fact that even though we were, our money was necessary to move it. Wait, no, wait, I guess wait, the question wait. is: do you, No, we do, do, are you spending your bond money? Yeah. Or are you not? We have to money? spend it to get the contractor. Right. They have to have the money. Yeah. Well, so then the contractor can do the work. They they would, then they both will be sued. Yeah. Both and us and the CPA. And what about the permits that need to, the permit applications that need to be filed with the state? You said about, something about permits. What about them? If we, if the town signs off on these permit applications, does that? Yep. Mm -hmm. That's that what makes you're us, saying. That's what makes right, okay, us. That's what I want to be clear on. Well, and I was suggesting that if the CPA instead would that shift the liability, and it would get at least add them, but it might shift some. You might get a challenge for top spot on the, on the list of defendants, but. 
because we're the deeper pockets or easier to go after. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. So it's a, it's a, it, you know, it is a classic chicken and egg, right? Mm -hmm. um, you've got a project that you want to do, that you think you want to do. You don't know what the voters think yet. Um, you've got folks who are uh, interested and invested and doing everything they can to help <coughs> move the project. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, the, um, but the risk remains. And if you, if you do not account for that risk, um, then you have, you, you should have real concern about uh, what, what might happen, right? Now, post-construction, post-certification, post-acquisition of title, um, it becomes a risk management problem, not unlike owning this building. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. By CGL policy that hopefully you never have to claim on uh, or nobody has CGL, to CGL, what's that mean? Uh, commercial general liability. Okay. A personal injury, property loss, somebody falls through a window and gets hurt, um, the front door sticks and they trip or you know, whatever. You've made, you know. Yes, it does. It does stick. I know it does. <laughs> I've opened that door a couple of times. You fall down the back staircase, right? Somebody comes down from upstairs, they fall down the back staircase, break an arm. And so, uh, you know, then, then it's risk management. Um, and it, it's just like, as I said, whether you, whether you run highway trucks or you own this building or you own the dam, it's, you know, mm -hmm. it's all the same. Yeah. All the same problem. Once, yeah, after, and after, I, after the construction, and the and the challenge, and and then we get, you know, we should we should con look forward and consider how how and whether how the town might manage that that risk that you just described. How would we how would we protect against it? Whether we want to, but that's different and and easier than. <coughs> Getting from here to there, um, yeah. and then and the here to there, we still, we we have the, we still have the. Paying for it, managing liability in the interim that are. And we and we can answer these questions in any order. We can answer the how do we pay for it? How do we manage risk? And and we could still get to the third question of of post-construction risk and say too much, um, don't want to do it. We could say, well, we can handle that, but we get stuck in here somewhere. I mean, any of these, mm -hmm. it's, it's a little bit of a, mm -hmm. you know, the sweet spot is all three pieces. Funding it, managing the liability in the interim, accepting the risk and covering, to, covering it protecting ourselves to the extent we feel we need to um, in the third in the in the post construction is the third in my mind is the third leg. And in terms of wanting to the, do the project, I would characterize my uh, support as being willing to support a project that is really important to some people if if we can address each of these three pieces. How is it how is it funded, and is in in take in in that approach, or am I as a select board member serving my town um, responsibly? Am I acting responsibly in my role in, in how it's possible to fund it, how it's possible to cover insurance or cover liability in the interim, and then ultimately the third leg is the post-construction liability and, error and the available protection, does that still allow me to feel like I'm doing my job as a select board member on behalf of the town? That's me. That's okay. exactly it for me, too. So I have a question. If CPA were to get a petition signed by the requisite number of voters, then we have to put it on the ballot or do a special town meeting, whichever so way. One question? Or yes. any, qu any question. Any question. Yes. Well, then it um, and it passes. Then the select board 
What, what then? What happens then with the select board's involvement if the bond passes? Well, it's still being responsibility to manage the town. I'm, I'm not sure I follow the question. I'm just saying. I'm just understand too that at some point you're going to cross over into a place where you may want to do ask this question in the executive session as opposed to in public. But go ahead. Um, I'm just going to ask a question so I can well, see. What I maybe, can maybe maybe articulate the question, but then I might ask for executive session because we don't want to put bond. Is your question that the bond then forces us to then yes. not consider those interim other risks? Right. I think it's how we word the bond, right? No. But, well, no. well, I would imagine we can spare Bob offering yeah. attorney advice and the rest of us can just use. <laughs> yeah, um, I'd, rather, I'd rather not. I'd rather have the, an answer. Um, well, so I'm going to still say what my musing is, and then we'll ask for executive session maybe for 10 minutes just to get some real crisp answers. I would imagine, as with anything, any, any vote or anything that's petitioned legally, properly, um, then it's not select board's choice to put it on the, on the warning. Right, yeah, I know that. Um, and, and then we are, in a, we are in a different position, both in how we handle that item uh, in terms of you know what we say to people three. whether we've whether we've supported it not supported it and then but if it passes we still have to manage it because the town voted for it and we have to manage it i would imagine that's well that's my question is if it does go to a bond vote and it passes then the select board has to handle the results of that vote well, going forward, it right? It depends how the, I mean, if there were two, a two-piece vote, one, that the town will build the dam contingent on the bond, and then the bond were approved, but I, I don't know how, can voters circumvent the board and, and, and cause liability to the entire town through an Australian ballot vote? Or is it, do all we have a superior why, responsibility why don't, why don't, to the town? All that the, all that the, the depending on how the petition is written, again, and how the question is, and understand that you would have, even a petition for article doesn't necessarily go to the voters uh, verbatim, right? Because you have a responsibility to make okay. it clear and understandable and, and properly formed without, okay. so long as you don't violate the, the, intent. the substance and intent of what it's okay. been a okay. Oh, for it, okay. right? Mm -hmm. But um, all I, I am assuming that the question is, if someone were to say, uh, "Here's a petition for the following article," shall uh, shall the voters approve the issuance of general obligation bonds or notes in an amount not to exceed X for the per following purpose? Right. Um, question mark. Yes or no. It's a properly formulated Australian ballot question. It is something that the voters have authority to vote on, so it's, it, it's not advisory, it's a, it's a live question. You would be obliged to put it to the voters. Mm -hmm. And what would come out of that, if it were a, a yes vote, you, there would be authority to issue a bond for that project, mm -hmm. or bonds. Mm -hmm. And if it was no, then there would be no for that. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm getting That's at. all. Yeah. That's all it would say. But it, it doesn't necessarily move the project forward. Right. Any, it's just the bond. It's, it's just for the funding of it. Right. Right. Given my hypothetical question. I, I am going to ask if there's a motion to go into executive session for, let's assume, 10 minutes to uh, seek a current attorney in here, attorney client privilege. Yeah, and we could go in the. We can go in the make a filing first. Okay, if well, all right. That. So that, that's a good point. Wait, wait a minute. Thank you for reminding us. A finding that premature public right. knowledge of what would be discussed would place the town at a substantial disadvantage. Right. If right. that finding is made, and then you can move to go into executive right. session. We usually have those right in front of us. Yeah, I don't think I brought mine. Is there is there a motion uh, for sure. to well, make the finding under section under title title one section three one three a um, to that a mature public knowledge would put the town put the town at rest. So mm -hmm. moved. Is there a second? Second. Yeah. All in favor, please say aye. 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 
Is there a motion to go into executive session pursuant to the previous um, finding to receive attorney-client privilege and advice? And invite our town attorney to and join us. invite the attorney to join us. So moved. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Uh, I think we can. So where's this? It's, 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 it's right through there. Okay. The mechanical room. I think there's okay. room. If I'm going to be. Does it have a cone of silence? <laughs> I think that's a fair question. <laughs> Only people my age and older can understand that. Well, it's kind of cool. It is really, it is really cool. Let me go on. Let's go look at the room. Go look at the room, and Wayne, you're going to turn the camera off. Yes, I'm going to help. Come, Come on up here. Sit next, next to Bob. Come and join us. Come join the panel. Thanks for coming, friend. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Happy to do it. Happy to do it. Okay. How can I help you? So. Well, uh, you can come back in the open so Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. And what time is it? We do better. Remember, we're not this, here yet. We don't have you here. It is. Uh, so we've got to stay for the night. Yeah, but there's no business. All right. The. Uh, board is coming back from our executive session and we have nothing to report and Fred is um, passive do we want to wait for Mark Mark is yeah. do we want to wait right for back. Mark right I know but he's in the bathroom and he's not here I'd like Mark to hear everything I'm going to use the mention I was going to say if he's going to be in the bathroom I'd like to be in the bathroom yeah. <laughs> Give us two minutes. Just wait for more. Just rotate. Oh, you can keep repeating yourself. You know who I saw for the first time today? The longest time? Yeah. John Fox. Oh, really? Have you seen John for a while? But he stopped by the other day. He just all he did was knock on my door. He said, I'm here. I said, okay. Good. So he was in the office? office? Yeah, he was actually in the office. Why? Is he not supposed to be? Oh, he's supposed to be. He's supposed to be, he's supposed to be there every day, but Fred and Passy keep him busy. Yeah, ah, there keep, you go. Keep him busy. Uh, oh, yeah. He, there he you go. Walk set. I wondered if he's still working there. There he was. Actually, we're, 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 we're now a management team is now going to go into the office uh, the first Monday of the month, and I was talking to my boss, the Joe, and you know, tell them, well, you know, my advisor is bringing the Disney people back four days a week. I said, well, why don't we go to the tax? I think the market is doing it. You know, there's a lot to be said for teams and uh, social interaction and kind of performing at higher levels when you're actually in the person. Okay. We're, we're, uh, we're all back. In, we're all back. Um, okay, Fred. Welcome. Take it away, Fred. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for being here. Yeah, so... You heard the earlier conversation. Uh, insurance popped up at a couple of points. One is insurance during the project itself, and then one, and then the um, insurance after the project. And your passive role is municipal insurance. So why don't you speak to us about where municipal? So just to be clear, I sent an email to you, and you responded. I had seven points in my email. Um, you responded to that. Okay, well, if you have an email handy, that would be good. But, um, I guess one thing I, I would just, in hearing some of the prior conversation, and, and Bob would certainly know more about kind of the structure of how this may have been done, but we did have a situation uh, late, fairly, probably five, six years ago, where they had a, a dam issue, so to speak, and they needed to the owners of the properties were concerned, the towns, and there's three towns there, Thetford, West Fairley, and Fairley, um, all on Lake Fairley, and they were concerned about dam failure, loss of property value, loss of recreation, et cetera. And what they decided to do and did is they actually formed, my understanding, they formed a separate kind of a district, I mean, a separate municipality um, called the Tri-Town Commission, and it is comprised of, I believe, appointed board members from each of the three towns. I do not know what the funding mechanism of that was, and I do not know what the funding mechanism of, of the dam reconstruction was. However, they did do a full dam reconstruction 
And I believe that there are um, taxes, charges, whatever, to individuals within the town, whether it's just abutting lake owners or all residents. What did, you, what did you call it? It's called the Triton Commission. It's uh, Thetford, West Fairley, and Fairley. <coughs> and, and so we actually, we actually, thanks, Sean. We actually cover, we actually, once they completed the construction, they, so they're a municipality, they're covered by passive, they have no ostensible property, they have general liability, public officials liability, and it is. And so we provide downstream liability coverage for their new dam. And at what level? It's our state, that's all we provide is a million dollars in downstream liability limit. Downstream it's liability. Per, it's per dam. It's not like per town. Each town is Correct. Has Correct. It's, it's for, for each structure. structure. Yeah. So it doesn't ensure <coughs> the, the dam re itself the rebuild will not be covered. Nope. The, the, that's a property coverage. So that, there's no coverage for that. We do not offer coverage for that. That would be. But you do provide property coverage for a town hall, but in the case of dams, you do. Correct. Okay. So yeah, dams, we do not provide, like a, a, a building burns down, we'll build you a new building. So that's, that's property coverage. In terms of dams, we don't do that. So all we will provide is down. And that's dams. a policy choice, or is that just what's not done? That's yeah, that's a coverage choice on passive part, okay. just because dam replacements can be, some of them can be rather pricey. Mm -hmm. And so we make we've we've made a coverage choice to only provide downstream dam dam downstream liability coverage with a with a limit that we can we can tolerate as a, as a municipal pool. You know, that doesn't mean that there's not other coverage and higher limits that might be available. Actually, I tried to get information on that today. Um, however, just by the time the person got back to me with some questions, it was three o'clock and I sent off my responses at four and you know, I can't, don't have service, but I, if she's in Houston, I doubt I got an answer. I was <laughs> sniffing around, looks like the Hartford insurance commercial projects such as hydroelectric dams and wind turbines. Um, so maybe that's possible. Who did you send? You said who did you send your questions to? Uh, well, we work with our our partner, our broker, Guy Carpenter. They're part of Marsh Marsh Mac. Um, they're a national kind of broker firm. So mm -hmm. Guy Carpenter is within that giant parent uh, brokerage, and so we have a, a partner there that we sent the information to, and they're they're a national broker. They work with all the markets, all the wow. carriers. So. I mean, I think that um, depending if it's a brand new dam, you, there might be some sort of a, a standard non-surplus lines coverage, but because it's kind of more of a specialty coverage, especially on a smaller dam, might be more a risk. But it's hard to know how the how they would underwrite it. Um, but I've represented that you know here's a scenario: what kind of limits could we get if we had a brand new installed dam that was engineered? We had a complete inspection. It was kind of whatever permitted by the state of Vermont. So there's some regulatory oversight in terms of what would be installed, and we get kind of a you know a sign off by the engineer at the end of the day. What kind of coverage limits might we provide, and how much will, would that roughly cost? So that's the kind of that would be a separate and aside policy in addition to yours. It that's would be, right. You wouldn't reinsure. No, well, what we what, what we that yeah, what, what we would suggest would be um, you take our million limit and then you take this as excess over right. that, mm -hmm. and so you would just to build to stack your limits so yeah. you can get a higher limit. And so a, a, a yours would be price. primary. Yeah, ours would be primary. Right. Yeah. Right. That's right. And so you know, essentially, if you have a loss and it's a million dollar loss and that's all there is. Then you know that's all us and none of them. Right, and and your questions, Fred, uh, included the question of coverage for dam replacement itself. No, I didn't talk about that, but I certainly can. We can certainly explore yeah, we that, can if, that's, that if, if you're interested in yeah, insur sure. actually insuring the dam right. itself. Yeah. And did you you didn't come up? You didn't ask them about a specific amount. No, because it's just at this point, it's you know they wanted to know when was the last inspection and everything else. It's like, well, no, no, we're talking about a completely brand new, brand new rebuilt dam. So you know, it, it's 
it's hard for them to, they can't issue a quote because, you know, we're looking at in the future a year, two years, and they won't even know what the rates are. Right. But they can hopefully give me just a very general, vague, well, it could Based be. Based on current rates. Yeah, I mean, right. They can right. give me something, and that's kind of, yeah. when I get that, I can certainly share that. And you have you used them before for something like this? Well, we use them all the time for a variety of specialty coverages. Um, we can get you know, cyber coverage, specialty kind of higher limit cyber coverages. We use them for builders' risk placements for construction projects. Uh, when, you know, municipal buildings are built, usually there's a builder's risk uh, policy that needs to be in place. Sometimes a contractor will get it, depending on what you use, whether it's an AIA, uh, AIA contract or some other one, a lot of times it just places that burden on the, on the owner. Yep. And so um, we help the, our members place that coverage. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you for doing that. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's exactly the right question, is what else is available after a million dollars? Yeah. I mean, I think there will be some limit available. I just haven't. At this point, I have no idea what the price would look like. And, and I guess I can also comment that, um, so we've got, and I think one of, you, one of your questions maybe was, or maybe Denise, it was yours, but there were some questions about, you know, how many dams do we have? And do we have? So you have, this dam is currently classed as, a, I believe, a class two or significant hazard dam. So right. dams are class one, two, and three. So one being kind of high hazard, two being significant, and, and three being low hazard. So this is kind of in the middle. It really is overall a relatively small impoundment of water yeah, compared to some. Um, so the way we rate is we rate it based on, on that hazard class and, and class one dams are, are rated with a, with a higher rate and then pretty much the twos and threes are at the lower rate. So this would qualify for the lower rate. I think I quoted six, or, or estimated, yeah, you know, we're looking five, like six, seven hundred bucks or yeah, something. But when it's, Per year for downstream liability coverage, so not not a huge amount. Uh, we do have right now. We've got a total of uh, sixty-eight dams that that we cover for downstream liability. Wow. Um, Seventeen of them are class one, and then all the rest, fifty-one of them are class two or three. And really, our process to, for doing that is we really look at the dams. Um, each one, it's not an automatic acceptance. Like if you. You know, you buy a building, kind of, unless it's over a certain value that, you know, we're, you're automatically accepting that into coverage. Um, a dam is, is a unique situation and subject to underwriting approval. And so what we do is, you know, we look at the state reports, any engineering evaluations and the history of the dam. We do site inspections. We'll look at Google Maps and Google Earth and look, try to estimate kind of the flood zone. And a lot of, a lot of the reports, and especially a lot of the dams where they're of, um, questionable integrity. There's been already engineering studies done, and certainly in the case I think this one, there were some engineering studies done that talked about inundation and damage to life and property and so forth. And so we look at all of those types of things and then decide like what's the risk. And any dam that's in a, a poor condition, we, we're not going to accept at all. But if when it's rebuilt, it would no longer be a class. Two risks. No, 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 yeah, it would likely right, it would likely be the same because it's impound it's based on not the condition of the dam, but on the amount of water impoundment and on the downstream risk to life and property. So that's that's kind of the, the classification that, that I, whether it's FEMA or you know the national whatever the dam um, unit is in the in the federal government. Um, but that's their classification method. Um, so, so it has nothing to do with the condition. It would still be a, a significant hazard dam, however, we would no longer have a dam in poor condition. And, and the risk for loss would be greatly reduced because it's a new dam. Right, right, okay. That's what I want to be clear on. Uh, so six is seven hundred dollars. Um, so, so, <coughs> is it, am I clear? Um, um, it sounds to me that it's clear that if in some point in the future we're on that third leg, the town owns the dam, um, then securing coverage up to a million isn't the hard question. It's affordable, it's available mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. And the bigger question is 
the, at least for this is just the, <coughs> the awareness that a million dollars isn't going to cover damage if that is a fail, point number one, downstream damage either. And there's, that doesn't cover the reconstruction of the dam. So we started researching what, what could that look like for yeah. us. Okay. Okay, so you'll, yeah, you'll let us know when you. Yeah, I mean, it, it, okay. I, I, and I'm not sure where we'll, I'll have all those answers this week, but I will certainly try. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, we appreciate it. Thank you. Any other questions for Fred, folks? I have a question, if you don't mind. Sure, go ahead. Fred, what's, um, what are you doing for in-place general liability coverage? What are you recommending? Because you know, down, downstream liability is one thing, but loss of the dam investment is another. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you seeing anybody that's covering that CGL liability, basically? Um, and and so and where's the, where's kind of the general liability exposure there? Just just, um, just a loss of the resource or yeah, failure of breach of the dam. And so who's damaged by that? Not not the parties downstream that no, are injured. Just, no, it would be the investment in the. Oh uh, yeah, I mean that's it's it's that that doesn't seem like a liability loss to me. It seems more like a first party property <coughs> loss. Yeah. And so, and we, we've not had any members um, ask the question. I mean, in a lot of cases, uh, I mean, it, it just for general knowledge, I mean, it, the state of Vermont kind of has a dam crisis in a way because there's a lot of dams that they don't know who the owners are. And there have been a number of municipalities that have ended up kind of assuming ownership of them, and some of them are in fair shape, good shape. Poor shape and the poor shape ones obviously we're not going to provide any downstream protection for from a liability perspective but really none of none of the municipalities have asked the question about ensuring that that dam that structure itself and what do we, how do we replace that loss if in fact there's a total loss or partial loss or damage to it mm -hmm. so does that kind of include I mean, I'm put a hypothetical out there we lose the dam and would property owners around that that are shorefront people, or would they would would we be liable to them at that point for drops in property value or whatever? You know, for mm -hmm. this is like a you know mm -hmm. uh, that by assuming that you know by assuming that liability for that dam and owning it, taking ownership. You know, like right? how does now, those are the questions that are kind of <clears throat> often answered. Court. I, I don't know. <laughs> That's what um, I was thinking. I mean, you know, and, and, you know, I mean Bob, yeah. you know, they kind of told you this earlier. I mean, you know, you can basically be sued for anything. It doesn't mean that that the suit will, you know, you know, that the plaintiff will win, but um, you know, there will provide defense and then you know, up until the point of the coverage determination is made, and then if a coverage determination is made that that the, that the claim or the, the liability risk has coverage, well then we'll go to the, the end of the road with you. And if a determination is made that there's no coverage, well then we defended you up until that point and then there's no coverage. So then our duty to defend would end at that point. Yeah, nor, nor any more defense. That's the important piece there. What does that mean? That means you don't have a lawyer. Up until that point, passive is defending you. They're, they're <coughs> representing you in litigation. Right. They come to a conclusion that there is no exposure for them under the policy. They, they either do it under uh, a reservation of rights, which says we have the right to come back and get our money back, or you can do it yourself. We, and, and we, we dealt with this. The reservation of rights is pretty common. However, you know, it, up and once you realize that, okay, well, clearly we don't have a responsibility under this policy, and it's, which is a contract, essentially. Yeah. We don't have that responsibility because there is no coverage, then our duty to defend ends. And then, and, yeah, and Bob will tell you, I mean, that's the legal, legal, right? with the legal the expense, I know you did. Yeah, and we then, had the crane issue, that this is where we ended up. Yep, and I mean, the, the legal cost can be substantial. I mean, we've defended, uh, we've defended claims, <coughs> I know we spent, we spent over $200,000 in legal, and we, we, we won the case. Um, but, you know, that we were $200,000. <laughs> right, so I just have a, Every time I hear CGL, I think of certified local government. I know that's not yeah. it. Commercial, 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 commercial. And, and, I mean, and that's really kind of the, 
I'll say, like Bob said, it's, it's the kind of a commercial version of, of liability coverage. And passive does, we have our own manuscript coverage documents, so they're, they don't follow ISO, they don't, they're not standard commercial general liability coverage forms. However, it's, it's basically, it's accomplishing the same thing. It's easier to think of it that way. Yeah, yeah. It's a terminology. So it's just general liability coverage, maybe. Personal injury, property damage. Right. So, so third party. So I had asked Fred a question. Um, so, so the engineer, engineering firm Dubois and King in this case, would, would sign off on the dam as having a lifespan of 50 years. That's what they would certify it as having. And the question, I asked a, a number of questions related to that. I asked if, as we got closer to the 50 year mark, um, would uh, the risk in, in your eyes incrementally increase and therefore would our rates increase one? And the other question was, once we hit 50 years, you know, would you uh, continue to provide coverage and in, uh, what would the conditions of that be? And I guess an ancillary question would be, what are the kind of certification or what, what are the, how often would an engineer have to come out and conduct uh, inspections and certify that the dam continues to be, have, you know, have the integrity it, it needs to have to be safe um, okay. in order to ensure. So you provided me some answers to that. Yeah, I mean, I, and let me just probably for, for, for the board and I can kind of maybe expound a little on that. So, you know, we, we under, we'll, we'll underwrite these you know, periodically, and so, and, and I would imagine that this dam, like many other dams, is going to be subject to state inspection periodically, right. even though that's a, we know it's kind of a, a laborious process and not as frequent as they would like, but nevertheless, you know, the inspectors do periodically go out, so we would rely on those reports, and then really it becomes incumbent upon the, the town to perform whatever maintenance is appropriate based on those examinations to keep the dam in a, a good and safe operating condition so that you know you kind of get that you know the dam is in good condition kind of situation um, what can happen is whether funds or people change or things happen dams obviously we've got a lot of deteriorated dams because people haven't paid attention to them and so that's the risk if the dam deteriorates to a point where uh, the condition is such that we have an underwriting concern then you know we could say that you know we're, we're going to choose to no longer provide you know coverage unless substantive improvements were made and it was kind of restored to condition x you know that is a scenario i would I, you know if we were going to do something like that we would um, I mean, obviously, the boards and subsequent boards would have a lot of warnings because you'd be getting reports from the state that would show kind of a well, theoretically, steady decline. That's right. Um, and so there's plenty of warning there, but at some point, then we'll be concerned from the risk side, and you know, we'll say, well, we we don't believe that it's a really a risk that you know this this municipally owned insurance fund that really is owned by all Vermont municipal members should be taking off. And so then at that point, we give the town notice that, you know, that's our plan, and then you would kind of want to decide how you would, the town would respond to that. Is, is Hardwick Electric uh, considered a municipal entity? They are a member. So are their dams insured by Placer? They are. Some so the Nichols Some Pond Dam, when it, they had That one is not. Ah. I inspected that one. That's so the one they had to ago. drain that down because yeah. the dam was deemed unsafe, and uh, then there was. So that's like the East Long Pond, right? Uh, Nichols Pond. Yeah. East Long yeah. flows into Nichols, okay. and then Nichols is that big steep one. Okay. So they dewatered that pond, and an anonymous donor gave like lots of money to fund most of it because Hardwick Electric could not afford. <laughs> Uh, to try actually charge their ratepayers because they weren't using it anymore as a hydro mm. facility, That's right. so they could not justify they it. Put it in the race base. Right. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I think we have we have the Walker right. Dam. Yeah. Um, which, uh, yeah, we've got Mac in mean, the back. Mac okay. Okay. So I was just curious. Okay. And again, they have the Heart of Electric dams have a maximum of a million dollars in coverage for downstream liability. Yeah. Okay. That's 
Mm -hmm. yeah, and, I, and honestly, and I, I don't know if they have any separate property coverage on them or not. Because <laughs> there is, for, for hydro facilities too, there's, there's this New England Power kind of pool that offers some insurance coverage to uh, New England Power generators. And so I know a lot of the municipal electric generating um, generators actually use them for some of their property. Like mm -hmm. Morrisville Water and Light was doing it, Lindenville Electric was doing it, um, just a couple off the top of my head. So it may be that they do have their dams insured. Uh, Swanton Village is another one that has big dams. Mm -hmm. and, and whether that's that property is insured, I don't know, but I do know that we don't cover it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's good. Uh, any other questions for Fred? Fred, we want to hear from you as soon as you hear back from Houston. Uh, that, that's Marsh and Matt. Yeah, yeah Marsh McClendon, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it'll, take, it'll take a couple days, and um, just depending on her access to markets and how quickly the carriers get back to her mm -hmm. you know, based on her questions. And so, you know, it's tougher when you have like hypotheticals. You know, if we said, well, here, here's the payroll, here's the number, whatever, and then you can kind of get quotes. A little quicker, so it's a little more hypothetical. But well, you give a, a construction cost number of seven hundred thousand. It's a pretty tiny dam. Well, and we have, we, I have, you know, some of the stats, and they're, you know, it's a one point nine mm -hmm. miles of drainage area. Yeah. And it's, you know, so many acres and so high and that kind yeah. of thing. So now, we've got some stats. So I have written down that this company you're checking with is called Marsh and Mac. Marsh McLennan. It's, it's a brokerage. They're yes. not the company yeah. for these. They, they seek out companies. Yeah, yeah, I'm just trying to just have some notes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Marsh McLennan. I mean, they're, they're publicly traded national brokerage. They're like the largest brokerage firm in the world, essentially. One or first or second. Okay. Um, I think I want to, I, my thought is that maybe we want to go into a second session of the board to digest what we've heard mm -hmm. after finding that premature public knowledge would put the town at a disadvantage. I just feel like we've heard a lot of things that bubble into are we how, do we wanna see, how do we want to think about this. And, and are we going to have any public comment? Uh, we could have public comment if people want to offer public comment. I haven't seen hands raised. Okay. I do want to keep this somewhat, well, it's 8.30, and the, I do want to make sure that the board has time to have its own conversation. Let me just be really clear about this. Well, this is all fresh in our heads, and we're not all completely fried. So I'll ask you to make your public comment with some respect to leaving the board time to work with a fresh brain, even though it's 8.30. So I'll start, I'll start here. <laughs> Mark. We yeah. heard his name. I, no, I wanted to start on this. On this no, that's fine. I just want to, I want to yeah, provide yeah, information, John, that's all. Yeah, okay. John, you're first. Um, I'm quick. I'm just going to pass out this document. I'm here as the president of the Maple Corner Community Store. Uh, the community store is owned by the community. The community bought it for $450,000 uh, in 2011. Or 20? In 2020, right. Okay, so um, th this, doc this paper shows the um, seasonal revenue of the community store historically. The seasonal revenue is higher in the summer because the dam uh, is there. We get money from people who are visiting Curtis Pond uh, and summer residents of Curtis Pond. There is not enough people in Maple Corner and this vicinity to support the store in the winter. Without Curtis Pond, it's certain that the store will close. So um, that's a vital resource for this, for the west part of Calais. Um, and um, so I just want to make it clear that, um, that we're completely 100% dependent upon the dam. Even if the dam failed for a couple of years, we probably would not survive. Um, so I just want to make that very clear. And that's what I'm here to say. Thank you. And our mission is right there. So our mission is to bring our community together. Um, we're not a store for, that is trying to make a profit. 
Uh, we just want to break even and bring our community together. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for John? John? Does anyone have John? I wanted to ask if anyone have questions. Well, questions for well John? so you guys are the, the target of that dam if it blows out, the old dam or the new dam. So it, what is your thinking on that? I, I don't want to we don't you carry to flood insurance, you so do not. we do not carry flood insurance. We cannot afford it um, because we're in a flood way. And um, so we are we are um, hoping that the dam does, gets fixed. Yeah. Um, we're we have no choice. We're dependent right. upon right. that dam for our for our our, our success as a store, and um, it needs to be fixed. And that's and so. Well, it's interesting. I mean, you don't have flood insurance, and some might think, well, that's bad. It's actually, from a town liability standpoint, it might be better because, you know, your flood insurance company would cover you, cover you and then they would sue us. So, uh, <laughs> so maybe we're in a little we bit don't have, We don't have a good lawyer. Money, lawyer. So that's a good thing. <laughs> so, don't buy too much at the store. Just enough. <laughs> right. All right. Thank you, John. Thanks, thank John. Thank okay, okay. Hand, let me shoot hands again. Does somebody over here want to? Uh, you want to speak? To me? Well, Denise, let's let me just see hands again, please. Okay. I'm sorry, I missed you the first time. You were the <coughs> to the right. Come on up. Yeah. I'm Jeff Deaton. I live from Crossman Store. Um, I I'm, might be making a point. What's your name? Tom D A N. Yeah. Um, my my point was just a quick one, which is that there's been a lot of discussion about liability and risk if we do try to repair the dam and no discussion, at least today, about the liability and risk if you don't repair the dam. Um, certainly there's risk, we all know that the risk is that it's going to break and flood the area, but of course, whether any such suit would be successful or not aside, I think everybody who lives in the area would sue the town of Callis if there were a breach of the dam that wasn't repaired, because everybody's known all along that the dam needs to be, be, be repaired. So you would, you're worried that there'd be lawsuits if you should take on liability for the repair process. I'm pretty sure there'd be lawsuits if you didn't take on. <laughs> but just to be clear, you know, the town doesn't own it. I know. If, but if um, Maple Corner Store yeah. had a fire, God forbid, yeah. at the Whammy Bar, and every, they couldn't get out in time, yeah. and we you know, kind of always thought, man, boy, they can't get out that door. I don't know how they got that door. They can't sue us. For having that knowledge, we don't yeah. own the store. They can sue the collective owners of the store. We I understand the circumstances. You know, we, we don't own the dam, and that, that, this is the situation. We want to be careful on taking on liability. Right, no, I understand that, but you've been so. given the understanding that you have the power now to take an easement or whatever the right terminology is in terms of ownership. Right, there are owners now who have made it clear that the town may have it. If they're going to fix it. Well, if it's if the voters vote to affirm I know. I'm funding, just saying you have the opportunity. There's a lot of this. things. I think what you're suggesting is if the voters affirm funding and then we didn't. Well, well that would be worse. That might, that might be. But I, I still would disagree with you on that. I think you're. Yeah. So the difference is is whether we have you know there's some latent or not latent expectation that the town takes ownership versus the legal liability legal responsibility of the town. And my understanding is we have no legal responsibility to take ownership of the dam. Yeah. So. I, I'm just I, saying, I'll, either way. Now, I'm just saying that as a community member, if I understand that the select board and the town had an opportunity to, f to fix something that was a hazard to the local residents and chose to turn their back on that, you can expect to hear some kind of you know, legal action, and that just makes sense. So that's sure, awesome. people can always sue. Of course, always exactly. Right. People, people can saying, always yeah. sue. People can always sue either yeah. way. You, if you do do it, and if you don't do it. Right. People will always sue, there's no yeah. doubt. Uh, okay. Marge. Marge. Marge, you look stressed out. Keep smiling. You're making forward progress. I just that wanted, I've been working on it, this project for about four years, working hard, and I thought we had a good relationship and we're moving forward in good faith. But I don't want to talk, I've been doing everything with the head, coming up with numbers, coming up with ideas. I just want to talk from the heart today. Um, I've been, we've owned our property for four years and we didn't buy it as an investment. We bought it because we love being there. And I can't imagine 
what the, it would be to the town of Callas if Curtis Pond was not there. We would lose so much. It, recreation, the community spirit, the historical of it, that I would think that everybody here should be working very diligently to try to figure out how to get this done. It's To me, it's such an asset, it's such a treasure to the area, to the whole town of Callis. I kind of resent the idea that it, it seems you just think the property owners are the ones benefiting from this. This is a community resource. We have the town beach there, this, this, even though it, it, you're a municipality, there's so many people that use this. I just think it would be such a loss, and it would be to the to Maple Corners, to Curtis Pond, and to the town of Catlips, that I think we should be doing everything we can. There's got to be some creative solution to this to get so, it done. So, so, so Marge, if I can interject, we're not trying to throw up roadblocks. We have a different set of responsibilities than you all. You understand, I know you understand that. We have a responsibility to the entire town and to protect the town. I and, agree. And, and, and so we have to go through, we have to ask all these questions. Oh, and we're getting that. answers. You, you've heard Fred, you've heard Bob. We're making forward progress. But we, we would be reckless if we didn't answer these questions and then wait to get answers from them and, and understand the answers and understand there's always a way whenever we come up with our budget we weigh you know is it do we buy that truck or do we wait another two years we're weighing this is what we do it's painful it's boring to some when you're the person who's affected by it it's painful but we have to do we do this with everything and it's exhausting for us too and we're not trying to throw up roadblocks we just want to make sure we dot the i's cross the T's, and do this the right way. This, and you know what, quite frankly, we didn't know this insurance information. Mark knew it two years ago. I'm not throwing Mark under the bus, but Mark came up here yesterday and said, hey, I knew it for two years. I should have told you. That would have been helpful to us. You know, we could have dealt with this two years ago. I'm not throwing Mark under the bus, but maybe I should have asked, or any of us should have asked that question two years ago, too. Mark just happened to get ahead of us on this, and. You know, so we're where we are, but this is not a roadblock. Fred's going to go check in on stuff. Um, there, there may be insurance above the million. Um, we have to cover the whole town. Yeah. So, so Marge, I hear you, and I feel your pain, because mm -hmm. we've been working on this for longer than you have. Um, well, she's been here 40 years. Well, we've been working on the dam, though, for 20, 20. years. Well, yeah, in, in, her mind, in her mind, she's been on it. Um, <laughs> but then, but it's just, I just want to say that we, wouldn't, we yeah. wouldn't be here tonight having this discussion in open session if we weren't trying to do something to move forward. Mm -hmm. So just know that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marge. Uh, Rini, did I see Rini's hand? No. Meg, John, Jane. Okay. Everybody. Mark. Mark had his hand. Come on, Mark. Before you start to speak, Mark. Did everybody sign in. Thank you. Everybody sign in here. Yeah. So. I think everyone signed in. I just at this point want to provide information. Um, one of the things that came up in your discussion was CPA being more involved in some way, sharing. Signing the application. Yeah, well, we time. have signed the application. Do you, Bob, do you know that, that the town and CPA have both signed the application? It's been submitted to the state. No, in lieu of is what. No, no, but I just, we have jointly signed the application. Bob, yeah. did you know that? Okay. Um, so, and I'm understanding that we would continue to do that. And um, I think. Although, we, I think the town hired the engineer. It was with our funds, That's so right. you know, we're pretty commingled there. Okay. Um, just for information, my memory, the, the state has done flood damage studies for the downstream that are all mapped out. And I think we're talking, I cannot remember whether it's seven houses or nine houses that could be flooded. But it's not rated, uh, what's the highest rating? It's not a high it's, hazard, it's a yeah, significant. It's significant because there was no loss of life anticipated. 
that, in other words. So it's, that's not <coughs> just providing information. In terms of maintenance of the dam, that's a really interesting issue. Um, one of the solutions that I thought of, and I'm not sure what the legalities are, but is that part of the fund, when we fund the thing, that we set aside some of the funds for a maintenance fund. I mean, I think that's, that would be a sound. A reserve fund. A reserve fund for the maintenance. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah I think that would be fund. really a good thing to do. And we now, my, that. Yeah, my memory, and again, I could be wrong, my memory was that it's not 50 years, it's 100 years. My no, memory I is asked, that I asked said this it. question specifically at the last meeting last summer. Yeah. I asked uh, Mr. Tucker, Jeff Tucker, so you're, you're, you're going to do sign off on the as-built as being built to standards and and what is the lifespan of, of a concrete dam of this this type and he said we would certify it for 50 years and i, I said think the state there's no there's no way you could right. build it well, differently you, he goes no that's the max we will do it that as engineers be, that may be but the state the state looked at two dams solutions one was the boulder, you know, just putting a whole bunch of boulders, and one was this solution. They told us that they didn't like the boulder because it only had a life of 50 years. And they liked the dam, the other, because it had a life of 100 years. Well, I'm just, put, I'm just telling you that conversation. I, I really don't know. But in any case, I think we would, should have to make It actually wasn't boulder. It was rebuilding yeah. the dam, it, relaying the stone, taking yeah, it down. More, and, more the stone. And, and more stones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that my assumption has always been that the contractor would have to be heavily insured and have there that one contractor that was on site with us is a contractor that does dams. And so I am assuming that we would require that they have Absolutely. liability insurance, including downstream liability. Absolutely. Well, uh, work, but, well that's while they're working on it. Right. While they're working on it. Yeah. But that's one of the risk periods right. that you guys are wrestling with. That's right. Do you know if the contractor has any kind of insurance after the dam is built? Like, does it have like a warranty? Or I don't think so. I don't think normally, I don't think contractors are ever responsible for it. Although, if there's a, let's say the dam collapsed, which I think, this is such a simple dam. But let's say it collapsed. They would be sued. And um, I think that their insurance, I don't their know. General you know their general liability. Well, yeah, general. I mean, you, you know, you, it just uh, it all depends. If there's a dam failure, then, you know, you know probably an engineer, there could be engineers are going to get sued. The contractor might get sued, depending on how long after it is. So, yeah. Uh, the town will get sued. I mean, so, I mean, everybody's going to get sued if there's a failure. And then it just, um, to, to the point about, is there if I, yeah. Speak up. I mean, so to the point about the, the contract, I mean, there is an element where, you know, should the town choose to, to move ahead with a construction project that to the extent you can wordsmith a contract that specifies certain uh, insurance requirements and certain limits and places those encumbrances or burdens upon the contractor, um, that can help control the municipality's exposure during the construction period. It doesn't eliminate the risk, but you know, with good legal review, um, passive's happy to look at it from the insurance limits perspective, which we often have the numbers, um, you, you, can, you can control some of that risk. You can't eliminate it, but you can control it. Okay, thank I don't you. Know, Bob, did you have any, anything else to add on contracts? But I think. You know, it's builder's risk. Yeah, it it's is. And then you might. Liability and how you allocate that risk is all part of the contract yeah. process. Right. And we could require them to up the amount of coverage, but we would that, that we'd be paying for it. You'd be basically through the contract. Through the contract. Yeah. Right. You're probably going to get paid, you're going to get asked to pay the premium. Yep. And yep. If, depending on who your contractor is, if you drive the coverage <coughs> risk limits, the coverage limits up high, it'll drive some of the people out of the market. Yep. Mm -hmm. They won't be able to insure. They won't be able All right, because there's a cap for them too. Well, uh, because they can only get what they can get. Yes. And, you know, right. The market is what the market is. I mean, right. in some cases, that you can't get it or it's just not uh, financially feasible. Yeah. You know, any doctor just put that risk on you. Well, you know, to provide the policy. 
for the town of Bypass here, whoever and the building We couldn't is. get a secondary policy to pass it during this interim period. No, we're not going to do build this right <coughs> okay. So, okay. So that would be, we have to, you know, that would be, depending on what you're looking for in terms of coverage, that could be a specialty coverage and that could be, and it would be an elevated cost. Yep. No doubt. It would be a cost that, whether the contractor obtained it and you specified they did, that's going to be part of the contract cost, or if you get it, it's going to be part of your cost either way. Okay. Um, Can I go on? Uh, what well, <laughs> you remember my point about the board needs some time while we yes, still think. Yes, it will take long. Okay. Um, I do think in terms of public benefit, um, this is my opinion. My opinion is that there's clear public benefit here. It's reducing flooding. The fact that you don't own the dam, aside from your obligation, it is a legitimate exercise of the police power of a town to protect its residents against flooding, to protect its town by having a facility that has wildlife protection, environmental protection, and all of these values. So put aside the question of whether you have an obligation. I think you have a legitimate public purpose here, which is very strong. Um, finally, now I'll just say what my opinion is. I really think it is a mistake to think of this as something that's primarily for the people around the, the, the pond. I think this is the single most important issue that I have seen this group of us have before us in the short time that I've been here. I think that it would be a disaster for this town to knowingly to see a situation which it could have avoided where one of its towns has dealt an economic body blow and where its swim facility and its camping facility and its citizens as a whole lose this, this whole thing. Not to speak of the enormous financial penalty that the town would pay by losing a gigantic amount of its assessed value which you will be forced to make up by assessing, by increasing taxes substantially, much more than the cost of the dam itself. Anyway, or even the liability of paying for nine houses. You could buy those nine houses for the price, for less than the price it will cost you if the dam breaks and you, everybody's place turns into a, you know, something on a mudflat. It's, it's going to be a disaster. And I hope you can see your way through to being activist on this and on behalf of the police power that you possess. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Okay. I would invite a motion to make a finding that premature, premature public knowledge will put the board of the town at risk. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And we a motion for the board to go back to executive session with our attorney joining us. What time is it? Uh, 8 8 53. We want Fred as well. I feel like we've got Fred's question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fred. I think we're good with yeah. Fred. So, you need me for anything else? Wonderful. No. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much for Thanks, Fred. Okay, yeah, so yeah. I invite a motion to go into executive session um, pursuant to the previous finding with our attorney joining us for topics relating um, to attorney conflict privilege. And, um, and we invited the town attorney? Correct. Mm -hmm. Is there a motion? Uh, second. 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 All in favor, please say aye. Aye. aye.